Hello and welcome to Living Word, growing a family that experiences every promise of God. For more information, visit our website at livingwordonline.com. You may be seated. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Uh, me too. <laughs> there's, there's something you feel when you come to Living Word. I can't wait. Every time they invite me, when I come in, I feel it. So I thank God for the atmosphere that God has given us. I thank God for the household of Dr. Thomas, his beloved wife, Pastor Scott, Pastor Jason, and their children. I thank God for what he has enabled us to do uh, for the kingdom of God. My wife is here with my dear daughter. Praise God. Amen. So it's always a pleasure. So when you hear me preaching deep, that's the woman. Praise God. If there's one thing I'll, I, I thank God for my wife, I always tell people, is that my wife has allowed me to hear God. She has allowed me to hear God. Thank you, woman of God. <laughs> Father, we thank you because the entrance of your word brings light and giveth understanding to the simple. Speak to us tonight, minister to our spirits. Touch us and change us. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout, Amen. Amen. In Second Peter, the first chapter, a conversation is given by this man of God as he grows old. He's in his last years of life and ministry. He's in the third phase, if you'll call it, of his life in ministry. Every minister has about three phases of life. Your journey is defined by those kinds of phases. And your priorities are different in the phases of ministry. Like you would look at, for example, um, Solomon, the man of wisdom. How he writes and speaks in the Song of Songs is different from how he writes in Proverbs. And how he speaks in Proverbs is different from how he speaks in Ecclesiastes. Because he's old, you see. And when you see the lessons and the things that he teaches, you can see his life transition because there are things that come by age. Are you hearing me? There are experiences that come and things that only God can teach by age. And either that is physical age, that's why the Bible says that a, the, a, a hoary head uh, is, 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 is of glory if it ages in righteousness. So I mean that every old head. <laughs> but the Bible says if it ages in righteousness. But also there is another way that we age in the spirit, and that is through the experiences that are given to us by God. You might not be so old in the body, but yet you have experienced a lot with God. Do you agree? Otherwise, Jesus Christ would not have, you know, done what he did at 33. He would have needed another 50 or 70 years of his life to make it happen. But that's not how God works. And, and so we, we, we see Peter in his late years of life, and he makes a very fundamental uh, statement to the church. He says in the 10th verse, Second Peter chapter 1, the 10th verse, he says, Wherefore, rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, he says, you shall never fall. He says, For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And after we have made our calling and election show, and a certain entrance is ministered to us, a certain access is given to us in the Spirit, there are certain things you cannot access when your calling and election is not sure. If you do not know what God has called you to do, if you have not transitioned from the call to the elected, I think I'll preach that late in the late evening service. Because many are called, but few are chosen. And there's a working of God to transition from just the call of God to the chosen of God. The distinctive mark, the indelible mark on your spirit, God that is blessed. Become a voice in your generation. That is a journey. And everyone, God has given that opportunity to access those places. But unfortunately, not many people are able to go there. They are comfortable being called. In fact, some Christians don't even know what they were called to do or be. Somebody shout amen. amen. And so he speaks of this entrance, this door, this place of access. And when that is ministered unto us abundantly, he says, now my responsibility to them which have understood their calling and election, 
I find that I repeat myself over something. And in the next verse, that emphasis comes through when he says in the 12th verse that wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance, always in remembrance. This was a constant conversation that he had with them which were called and elected by God. He says that you be, he says, I, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in the present truth. And 13th verse says, yeah, I think it meet, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I'll endeavor that you may be able to, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. He has spoken the word remembrance about three times. He's insisting that there is some that I keep putting the church into remembrance, them which are called and elected. And I find myself always repeating it to them. And he says, even in my last years of life, I will not cease to do that and hope that when I am long gone after I'm diseased, these things will always be in remembrance of you. He's talking about the things that your church must constantly remember, the things that we should never cease to put men into remembrance, the things that we must constantly put men into remembrance of. So if it's important for the church then in Peter's time to repeat, to have a repetition of these things, he's sort of giving us a foundation of what the message of the New Testament dispensation is supposed to be. He's telling us that there is something that has to continuously be reminded because it's the most important aspect about living the Christian life. And what is that? He says, I know that you know and you have been established in the present truth. He says there's something called the present truth. Not just the truth, but the present truth. So if Peter constantly, consistently continues to remind the church and teach always around the present truth, and I'll take you through a journey where Paul is bringing that conversation again to the church, we start to see that that became the apostolic mandate of the early church, the reason why the early church thrives and prospers in the hardest days. There were few, they were little, they were not yet organized and in order, they had not drawn systems and structures to sustain them as a ministry. Remember, the church of Jesus Christ begins at a porch, Solomon's porch. But there's something, the foundations that hold this church and sustain it to the place where you and I now can still connect from those old veins and still receive life. And that continuation of things that we shall hand to our children and our children's children. Peter calls it the present truth. Why does he call it the present truth? What is the present truth? The Greek word there for present is paremi. Paremi. It comes from two words. One is para and the other one is amy. Para is above. That which is above. That which is beyond. But he also adds, para also means that which is against. But he also adds that para means that which is contrary to what you know. Now, a me means to exist. So if I put these two words together, Paul is implying that there are truths that exist that, that exist that are above what you know, that are beyond what is usually known by the church, that are beyond what many people live in and apply themselves to. There are truths beyond. There are realities in the spirit that are beyond. But you cannot speak of that which is beyond when you have not yet defined what is supposed to be common, isn't it? I cannot talk to you about things beyond or things above or things contrary when I've not spoken about the things that are generally known. And so you start to see the truths of God defined and arrayed in different levels, in different places. Because it's only then that you can understand God. The gospel cannot be understood if it is not patterned. Especially for the Gentile. Because with a Jew, even without pattern, there's things that are embedded in tradition and culture that always align them to a particular order. 
But when it comes to the Gentile, we must understand this from a certain pattern. That is why when Luke is writing to Theophilus, he says, I had a perfect understanding of these things from the very first, and I choose to write to thee, O dear Theophilus, in their very order that thou might have the certainty of things in which thou hast been instructed. You can never have the certainty of things in the instruction of the Spirit if you have not had a perfect order of what comes first and what comes before the other. Are we following me? So when we get the order of things, what comes first, what sec comes secondary, what comes third, now Luke understands the gospel from that order. So if you want to understand the, the pattern of the gospel, read the gospel of Luke. Why? Because he's the only Gentile writer. And he's looking at the gospel from a Gentile perspective. It's amazing the eyes and what we see when you're not within the confines of the place that uh, is predictable. For example, there's a way from Africa I view you. The things that sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm in America, they shock me. You get it? <laughs> they just shock me. They're okay, but in my culture, I'm like, okay, you understand? <laughs> you understand? <laughs> I won't give examples. <laughs> Touch not the Lord's anointed. <laughs> and do my prophets no harm. But I believe if you come to Uganda too, there are things that will shock you. You'll find a guy eating a grasshopper. You, you find us eating things that you don't believe can be eaten. You understand what I'm saying? So, but it's, it's beautiful sometimes to have that eye outside the predictable polarization because it helps you understand life from a different perspective. Somebody shout amen. amen. Anyway, back to what I'm trying to emphasize because of time. So, we see that when we understand the order, Paul brings that conversation. He brings that conversation again in Hebrews chapter 5. And then he speaks of a man called Melchizedek. He's talking to men which are born again. But he says, but you see, of whom we have many things to say, but seeing that you are dull of hearing, you're not able to receive these things, but there's something we're trying to bring. He says, if you have continued to stay, babes, and you've not been able to grasp that which becomes the first principles of the oracles of God, how can we go beyond that? I can't even explain the priesthood of Melchizedek to the church. This is Paul speaking to Hebrews. Now he has introduced us to a conversation that they are first principles. They're secondary principles of the gospel. They're third principles of the gospel. You see that? In Hebrews, the sixth chapter, the first verse, now he brings to us the reality of what we call the doctrine of Christ, and he calls it foundational. You see? When he's emphasizing that negligence in the spirit, he speaks of that which be the first principles of the doctrine of Christ. And he talks about repentance from dead works, which is the message of grace, faith toward God. He speaks about the baptisms, he speaks about the laying on of hands. He speaks about the uh, eternal judgment and all these other things. And he emphasizes and says that these are, this is the doctrine of Christ. But that's the foundation of the doctrine of Christ. But he says beyond that, we're able to see beyond that. If we're to define those six things or so, if we can understand those six things, then we're able to go. And he says, and this we will do if God permit. But the literal translation if he is able to judge that we have actually understood those first things. If God can understand that you've actually understood what it means to live beyond dead works, to, lead, to have faith toward God, to understand the baptisms, plural, not one, to understand the laying on of hands, to understand the, the, the resurrection of the dead and the, ever, the raising of the dead and the, uh, and the everlasting judgment. He says, if you have understood this, then God is going to help you go higher. Because let me say this. I know you have, some of you have not, I don't yet see where I'm going. Not all truths are equal. They're all truths, but some truths are above any truths. For example, in the Old Testament, God makes a covenant with uh, Abraham of circumcision. So every male child is circumcised after eight days. Do we still circumcise male children after eight days because we believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? No. When we get into the New Testament, Paul transitions to the circumcision of the heart. Circumcision of the heart. You see, so circumcision still exists, but in the old as it was for the skin, 
in the new it is for the heart. You see, something has transitioned, something has changed. Now, to go back into the circumcision of the flesh would mean that this man has not understood the doctrine of Christ. Do we agree? So there are many things that are above others. Even when we start walking on this conversation of faith, there is faith above faith. There is actually a realm above faith. It's in the place of knowledge. You understand what I'm saying? There, there, there are places beyond... When we say we're preaching the doctrine of righteousness imputed, there are people who are stuck in the doctrine of righteousness imputed by faith. And that's true. But some of them have not gone beyond that. So when Paul appeals to us in Hebrews 6 that we will go into perfection, not laying again the foundation of the doctrine of Christ, he's saying that can we, from that foundation, choose to seek truths for our maturity? Now, Paul brings a conversation of this maturity. And he makes a very subtle statement. And he says, look, when we're talking about wisdom, we speak of a hidden wisdom, but in a mystery. And he says, this wisdom was hidden for your glorification before the foundation of the world. Which wisdom, the Bible says, if Satan had known and his principalities, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He says, I has not seen it, he has not heard it, he has not entered in the hearts of man that which he has prepared, but he has revealed it unto us by his spirit. Now, let's talk about this wisdom. Let's talk about this wisdom. There is wisdom that was hid from the foundation of the world for your glorification. That means when God sees you coming to the world, he starts to think, how can I get this guy to a place of glory like the world has never seen before. And he hid these things. So every inferiority complex we see in the church, every spirit of weakness, every spirit of, 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 of death and, 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 and frustration, every spirit of fear that we see walking around our people is because there's a certain wisdom that is not yet come to them. There's a certain understanding that is not yet come to them. If you are still fearful, even after everything you have learned, it doesn't mean that the demons of your grandfather are stronger than you thought. It only means that there is stuff you have not dug into yet. If you're still dealing with the thing that you fought 10 years ago, it is still the same thing frustrating you, then you must understand that your deliverance is not in the prayer realm. It's in the revelation realm. If you're still dealing with the same troubles of your family for five years, six years, you're praying the same prayer, you're repeating it over as though you're praying to an unrighteous judge, then it means God is saying, I'm not going to walk in the realm of your prayer. I want to walk in the place where you must know me. You must know me. Now, when we're talking about the truth above, when we're talking about the truth beyond, Many people live in a realm so inferior. Their vibrations are so low. The life that they live is so beggarly. It's so disadvantaged. It's, it's, a, it's a victimized mentality. They're surviving. They're in surviving mode. They, they live a life that if Jesus Christ was here, he would ask them, who did you believe? And God is telling us that, that it's, not, it's not that the devil is so strong or that these demons will fail to break them. No, look at Paul walking into Ephesus. Ephesus was the city of Baal worship. Every demonic god was in that city. And the Bible says when he reaches in Ephesus, he didn't even get a bunch of intercessors to join their hands to break Baal. Uh-uh. He says in Ephesus, the word of God mightily grew and they prevailed. He got to a point where he knew that you can preach poverty out of a nation. You can preach disease out of a nation. You can preach weakness out of a nation. You can preach fear out of a nation. You can preach indifference out of a nation. You can preach anything out of a nation when you know how. And this is what I believe, that we have entered in that place where the church, and COVID has opened us, our eyes, there the church must wake up. Because if we go back to the line of essentials and they start opening all the essential places and the church is down there, something is wrong. Something is wrong. 
It's not with the government. No, it's not with our scientists. No, they are doing the best that they can. But they have told us that before you come in, science is better. They have told us that before you come in, your economies are better. God wants to take us to a place where the church must become first again. He said you shall be above and not beneath, that you shall go upward and not upward only. When he's talking about above, he's not just talking about the physical positioning of things. He's talking about your place of understanding. We must read the Bible again. We must bring conversations back in the church. You see, do you know present day church has become so emotional that we speak to only things that appeal to your emotions? Do you want to know know why mental health has become an issue? How many minutes do I have? I'm past time. Cabra de Boza. Quebrando Zida. So you're dealing with a generation that is so emotional. Everything must appeal to them because they're hearted. As I told you, do you, want, do you want to know why you have a lot of mental issues in your days? Many voices are speaking. And you might think that this person is just losing their mind. No, they're not losing. They're hearing too much. They're, they're not sick. Uh-uh. I had a girl in my nation, Robina. They took her to a mental hospital and she had bipolar. Psychosis. The doctors tried everything and I said, this, this kind of bipolar, we don't understand it. I get my pastor pose him and I tell him, you know what? Go get that girl out of rehab and bring her to church. And they get a girl tied with ropes and they put her in the back and they started preaching and she was restored. I didn't rebuke the devil, no. I just had the understanding that I just needed to give her the right voice. There's a young man recently that was brought again. He was in rehab. And the guy ran mad again. Psychotic. Manic depression. And this lady who is a a, a nurse, uh, belongs to my church, just got summons and put these summons on this guy's head. And he listened every day. And the man's mind came back without rebuking anything. And he asked me, how does that work? And I tell him, look, it's simple. He just listened to the right voice. There may be many voices in the world, but there's none without signification. For if I know not the meaning of voices, then I become barbaric. The mental person struggling, they have many voices coming in, but they carry no meaning. They're hearing things that they can't explain. They're open to a world that nobody ever told them that that world exists. But when you get into that world, this is how you do what you're, what you're supposed to do. So we have raised a very emotional ministry, life and church, where you have to talk about their feelings. It's about how you shouldn't give up, how you won't die, how you won't do this, how you don't do that, don't worry, this will go. You see, but, but where is truth? Can we go back to places where we can get to a point where we start speaking things that, that, that even people who come in are like, what are they talking about? But we are somewhere. We know that we are somewhere. Because when we know the truth, the truth makes as free. So we are as free as how much is revealed to us. Let me give you a, 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 an example of something above. Because I think now I have like 10 minutes. I'm reading. Let me give you an example of something that, that a reality of a truth above. And I know that this might be contrary to what many of us call truth. But it is the truth. You see, when you look at the life Jesus lived in the flesh, the consciousness that the Christ lived in the flesh, who was a hundred percent man also. Yes, he was a hundred percent God, but he was a hundred percent man and he knew what it's like to have the God life. The Bible says that he found it no robbery to be like and to God. But he humbled himself It was just humility. Now, I want you to note that. It was humility for Jesus to be human. It wasn't his mandate. That means God has not called you to live like a human being. I'm I'm human, you know. I'm human, you know. I, I make mistakes, but I'm human, you know. God has not called you to be human. 
it takes you too much humility to be a human being. The reason why we walk like them is because we are humble. The reason why we eat like them, it's because we are humble. The reason why we speak with them and like them, it's because we are humble. But don't be mistaken. He says, you are in the world, but you are not all of the world. Somebody shout hallelujah. COVID is in the world. Does it affect humans or children of God? Where are you when COVID comes? Now I know I'm stepping on a lot of toes. <laughs> but when COVID comes, you tell me, are you human? Oh yes, Jesus was 100% human and was 100% God. But look at his consciousness. He had to be humble to be human. But in any other realm of consciousness, the Godhead was his identity. The God life was his identity. Are you hearing me? Would Jesus walk into a room and catch COVID, or if COVID caught Jesus, would he die of COVID? Understand this. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now that's a consciousness. It's contrary to science, but it is a truth. If it enters his body, it's of no consequence. If it enters his body, it's of no consequence. Why? Because he has the God life within him. Somebody shout hallelujah. Now, if you are to live with that kind of consciousness that you are not human, that you only humble yourself to the realm of humanity, would you blame a man who just wakes up in one morning and he starts walking on water? He wouldn't. Because he knows that the human being is subject to gravity. He's not. So we call that a miracle. With God, it's a normal thing. And Peter says, ah, yeah, 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 bro, delike, dubo, zila, bade. If you be the son of God, <laughs> a normal guy, and, and, and let me tell you something, Peter was not born again. Peter was not born again. Peter was not born again. No, 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 he wasn't born again. But it was a man who chose. And he said, if you be the son of God, bid me that I come. And not by dunamis, but exosia, Peter walked on water. Extended authority and not the in-working power. And the disciples live by exosia, not dunamis. Extended authority. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions. Those things shall by no means harm you. Go ye and heal the sick. Cast out devils. Cleanse the lepers. Do you realize that those instructions were not to new, um, to new creation? They were not to born again believers. When Jesus tells his disciples, you shall lay hands on the sick. When Jesus tells his disciples that you shall trample on snakes and scorpions, you shall drink poison, and these things shall not harm you, do you realize that he was not talking to men which were born again? Because the experience of salvation firstly required the death and resurrection of Christ, and he was not yet resurrected. So even to drink poison not to die is not a big deal. That is why one time when Paul in the New Testament is in Amalta, and a viper, the Bible says, stiffens on his hands. The Bible says he just shook it off and continued doing other things. He didn't call the congregation. He didn't testify about it because he knew it was normal. And everybody's observing to see how he's going to die. Paul is doing other things because... Because there's something in him telling him this is even smaller. What we're saying, you're not even called in the realm of miracles. Beyond that, you're called in the realm where you can actually extend the authority, the power of God operating on your life to someone who doesn't even know God. And the miracle works. It's the very process by which Paul gets a hunky. And the Bible says special miracles were wrought by him. That hunky is touching him, put on the sick, and them that were demon-possessed, they were healed. A, a guy in Barrera, we were having a crusade in Barrera. There was a blind man. These girls took a blind man to my poster, and his eyes opened. Because I have learned to commend myself to the consciences of men. But how do we do that? In the next line, speaking the truth. When the revelation of that truth comes upon you, everything around you is a miracle. But these things that I've said, not many people are able to understand them. Because we choose a lower life. We're still struggling to connect to simpler truths. Look at where God has called you. I cannot die like a human being. I cannot sleep like a human being. 
I cannot produce results like a human being. Even though I'm in this body, I'm not of this body. I refuse to think that way. I refuse to think that way. I know a very wonderful man of God that I love so much. He went to the doctor and they told him, you have diabetes. He told the doctor, I cannot have diabetes. He says, but the results say that you have diabetes. And he says, and I'm also saying that I cannot have diabetes. But sir, this is the science. And he says, this is the truth. And he walked back his home and laughed. And his wife finds him laughing at home. <laughs> He says, what's the joy? They say that I have diabetes. Aren't they funny? The guy laughs. Can you dare believe God? Can you dare believe God? So, so that people, if they do that, they'll die tomorrow. Are you hearing me? They'll die the next day. Because they can only live by what a man made in a pharmacy. In fact, there are two definitions of witchcraft in scripture in the Greek language. And one of them is pharmacaea, where you get the English word pharmacy. I'm not saying I'm against drugs. I know I'm offending right now. <laughs> I'm not saying that you don't take drugs. I'm only saying if you're putting drugs in your body every morning and you're listening to my voice, God says that those, that has an expiry date. Swallow them, but you're telling these tablets, even when you're putting them in your mouth, that you know what, soon I'm leaving you. Are you hearing me? That's called faith. That's called faith. The just shall live by supplements. The just shall live by drugs. No, the just shall live by faith. So I don't tell people to leave drugs. You could die and we lose you while we're still building your faith. But you must build faith enough to get that thing out of your body, whatever it is. Like I said, now I'm offending. Now I'm offending. But when the Bible says greater is he which is in you than he which is in the world, he means it. When God says that you have his life in you, he means it. When God says that you are more than a conqueror by Christ which strengthens you, he means it. When the Bible says that a thousand shall fall at one side and ten thousand on the other, but no, none of these things shall by any means harm you, he means it. The Amplified Bible says that only a spectator shall you be far away from affliction, he means it. The Bible says that ye are more than conquerors through Christ which strengthens you. He means it. That when the Bible says that how he anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. He means every disease can heal. He means it. Tell your neighbor, believe God. Now I us to stand to our feet as we finish. Only time, but I had a lot to say. I had a lot to say. But this is what the Lord impressed on my heart to tell you. Live above. Just live above. Live above. Tell your neighbor, live above. Live beyond the predictable life. Tell them, live beyond the predictable life. If they die, let them, but don't die. No, no, no. If they fail, let them do it. There is, let me tell you, in history there is, there is a testimony about a man somewhere who has defied something that doctors say cannot be defiled. I found a young man who had a cancer. It had eaten up his armpit and a whole chest area, Pastor Jason. And he comes to me about a year ago. And it had advanced. And I looked at him and I told him, look, one day, I'm going to stand before the camera, you and I, and we're going to testify together that that cancer has left you. And I asked him, are you able to believe it? And he said, yes. And I told him, let's just thank God. We raised our hands with thanksgiving. He came back about eight, nine months, nine months, and he comes into the room and told me, Apostle, <laughs> look, Look, Apostle, it is nowhere, Apostle. Look, 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 Apostle, you see. <laughs> Glory to God. Tell your neighbor, I choose to live above. 
In my finances, I choose to live above. In my thoughts, I choose to live above. In my health, I choose to live above. In my family, I choose to live above. In my career, I choose to live above. In my ministry, I choose to live above. You have done me well. You have done me well. You have done me well. Jesus. You have done. thank him for the word he has given you tonight and i want to ask everybody within the sound of my voice online drive in church here in person if you were to face eternity today do you know what eternity looks like for you and would you have peace with father god and you can have that because father god already offered the free gift of salvation to anyone who would believe believe what believe in his son jesus that he died for us and that he rose from the dead and to make him your Lord, right? You've tried life your own way for long enough. It's not working. Try Jesus. He won't let you down. And we just say a simple prayer to make that decision. Make it easy for you. Just repeat after me and mean this prayer in your heart. Dear Father God, forgive me of all my sin. And Jesus, I believe in you. You're the Son of God who died for sin and rose from the dead. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen.